Hello and welcome to this very special edition of The Partial Historians. I am Dr. G and I'm joined by my fabulous co-host. Dr. Rad. Hey, Dr. G. And not only that, we have a very special guest with us as well. We are joined by Casey Vogel, who is VP Publisher at Ulysses Press. And Casey has been working with us on our forthcoming, soon to be out, probably out by the time you hear this book, uh, this uh, this podcast. I've... Oh, yes. <laughs> Your Cheeky Guide to the Roman Empire. And we're so thrilled to have this book coming out with Ulysses Press. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to sit down, have a bit of a chat with Casey about how book publishing even works, how Roman history might be surprising and things like that. So welcome so much, Casey. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love this book so much. I love the both of you. So it's very exciting to actually be on the pod. Woo-hoo. I believe to hear that you still like us after I went way over the word count. There's <laughs> <laughs> oh. epics inside her. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> so, um, so. Oh, sorry. No, you go. I was going to say, so to start off with, we were just wondering if you could tell us, what do you look for usually at Ulysses Press when it comes to authors and sourcing books? At Ulysses Press, it's like pretty unique in that we are an independent book publisher. And a lot of the ideas that we come like we we come up with a lot of our ideas in-house. A lot of the time it's the editors and really everybody on the team talking about kind of what they're into. And then from there, we kind of generate ideas um, and then start talking to other people because while we think we may be brilliant in kind of our echo chamber, uh, we can actually have to talk with people like you all who are the experts who actually know anything about anything. Um, <laughs> we're kind of uh, just people who really, really love books. So that's really the unique thing about Ulysses Press and how we make our books and how you know we reached out to you two to do this one. We start with kind of the germ of an idea that can come from literally anywhere, anything, you know, a conversation, a trend, particularly this one, a uh, just a social media trend that has everyone talking about a certain topic. And then it kind of, you know, ripples from there, trying to find out, is this a book idea? Does it make sense? And who is the person who would write that? And so we have to, then we start talking to people to see like what's real and what what isn't and that's and that's kind of where it all starts that sounds really exciting that there's this whole sort of exploratory phase internally before you then turn and be like would this be a reality could we make a book out of this i think that's really a fun way to approach it is that different you would say from the way other publishers approach acquiring books or thinking about what they're going to have in their catalogs and things like that Certainly, it really depends on the publisher. Um, And I think more publishers are doing it the way that Ulysses Press does it more and more, but a lot of editors will work very closely with agents who are sort of sometimes those people doing the initial concepting or working together in order to kind of pin down those ideas. Um, The unique thing about Ulysses is we almost do it exclusively. We we do work with agents and obviously we love to be pitched ideas as well, um, working with our authors who we've worked with for a long time. Um, But uh, we definitely do it a lot less than some of the other publishers who work more directly with like getting more formal proposals um, sent to them and kind of working on shaping it from there rather than uh, kind of starting from nothing, uh, which is what we, we, we love the uphill, uphill climb, I guess, for those types of things. <laughs> Sounds like a really creative process. So, and I think that's really fascinating. And we were actually absolutely thrilled to be contacted by you about this time last year, I think. Yeah, it was actually, yeah. About a year, I think, maybe a little bit over a year, but not that much further than that. And we had just come off the back of writing our first book, and we we're like, we'd learned so much through that process. And it was with an independent publisher here in Australia. And all of a sudden to have an opportunity to sort of cut our teeth a little bit more uh, in a different market and with a different publisher is really exciting for us. So I'm keen to understand a little bit more about why you think Roman history has had a resurgence of interest with readers recently. 
I mean, we can't undercut the social media phenomenon of how often do you think of the Roman Empire? Uh, obviously, I think it got a lot of people very recently talking about the Roman Empire, but I think it goes, you know, back more further because sort of there's been a really big trend um, with stoicism in general, just sort of like as a kind of applying stoic principles to modern day life. And that has been happening for a couple of years. So kind of just goes to show that I think Roman history is sort of always in the zeitgeist. That's maybe not always as obvious to everybody as, you know, TikTok can make it um, for a moment. But to me, I think it's, it's evergreen. People love to learn about it, love to talk about it, whether or not it's as literal as the Roman Empire or, or something about it. So I think I think it's evergreen. Um, and I'm sure I mean, for the two of you, it's evergreen. Yeah, obviously, I'll give you day to day. <laughs> <laughs> that can be the new slogan for our podcast. Roman history, <laughs> evergreen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think for us, obviously, we love Roman history. So for us, it is an evergreen topic. But I think there is something to be said for this idea of longevity of history and interest in history. And particularly with the parallels that are often drawn in the media about uh, the history of America and the history of Rome. And that seems to be a really ongoing trope that has happened now for many, many years. And is really, I think, goes back even to the foundation documents of America. So that sort of uh, sense of which there is an intertwined inspiration for the modern U.S. and the way that the Rome, the Romans did things politically, whether that be, you know, the standout Republicans. I, I never get over the fact that Cincinnati is named after Cincinnatus, <laughs> the legendary uh, dictator of ancient Rome. And those sorts of details really speak to me as well. So I love all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I definitely agree that there is an evergreen aspect to what's going on here. So... Casey, as I mentioned in the intro, I did have a little bit of a problem with the word count, <laughs> Dr. G did, but that was mostly because the more I started writing, the more I realized that writing for a broader audience, I didn't really know what the average person didn't know about the Roman Empire. So we were really curious to find out what were some cheeky facts about Rome that you found out from reading our book whilst you were editing it. Well, I mean, it's definitely an editor's dream to have too much content. Um, it is. Uh, <laughs> that's, that on that's, tape. My, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my whole job. So um, that is not a problem. Um, love to hear it. Um, but in terms of kind of, of what I learned, I was actually flipping through. And my favorite, like just to pick, like cherry pick, like exactly one thing um, that I loved that I learned and I have to find it so I can um but I learned a new word which was so 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 fun um <laughs> oh my gosh when I picked up the book I I lost my page oh good um okay the you'll have to correct me the tintinambulum uh, yes yes a little floating hanging phalluses <laughs> who needs a wind chime when you can have a phallus wind chime <laughs> i loved that i loved that little story i loved learning you know ironically i loved learning about phalluses in ancient rome uh, very 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 <laughs> fun section and i was like this is such a good word it's a good word <laughs> so i that is that is now I'm going to try. I don't know in what situation I could possibly use it in, but it's going to be a goal of mine to try and use it in conversation and impress somebody somewhere. <laughs> well, you have to join us on social media for Phallus Thursdays. I mean, that's where uh, all of these interesting <laughs> phalluses began. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, in that section too, I mean, um, I did not know about kind of like the the birth myth of Romulus and Remus. I feel like, you know, and that has to go with these fiery phallic origin story sort of thing. I didn't know that part of the myth. I feel like you hear about the wolf a lot, um, but you don't really hear about the hearth-based phallus that started it all. So I was, that was like a myth I 
you know, really thought that I had like the basics of, and I was like, oh, wow, this is like the beginning of it that I absolutely don't know. So we agree there is not enough talk about how so many Roman myths start out with a phallus appearing in a fireplace. <laughs> it is quite a thing. <laughs> Uh, look, the Romans seem to have a, an especial fascination with phalluses, that's for sure. There are so many artifacts that remain of that, all of these tintanobalum hanging around in museums. So weaving this into your conversation, I think you can do this. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, maybe thinking about some of the maybe better known aspects of the book. So we we do have a few chapters that touch on, you know, well-known personalities from the Roman Republic and from the Roman Empire, like part of the imperial family and that sort of thing. Was there anything cheeky about the stuff that people, you know, might feel they know a little bit about that you discovered whilst reading the book? Huh. I mean, I I learned a lot and I think I feel like I'm trying to think I really loved the stuff that I can really remember are all of these like very small weird details so unfortunately I don't think I'm gonna have a great response like the thing that is coming back to me right now is about like the dolphins the the really toothy dolphins like I'm I'm, (laughs) I'm remembering very small like kind of very small um yeah why do ancient Roman dolphins have such pointy teeth why do they look so scary I think it's a legitimate question (laughs) So those are the things that really stuck with me. Um, I, gosh, I, sorry, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, oh, okay. No, I was thinking I um, always... maybe if I, if I jog your memory a little bit, we had obviously a bit on Messalina. We had a bit on the death of Claudius. Mm-hmm. We had Caracalla, which is obviously very topical for Gladiator 2 coming out. Spartacus, of course, uh, you know, the numero uno gladiator of the Roman Empire, thanks to the way that things have been preserved over time, I'd say. Um, I think we also had a bit of Augustus and Livia, Dr. G. And I got a love story going on. Yeah, Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. We had a few of those Mm -hmm. sorts of love stories and that sort of thing. Mm. I mean, I definitely, Spartacus for me was one that I felt that it's interesting just like how much of like the movie was my history, you know, like in actually reading, I was like, oh, so... I don't really know anything, I guess. Like, you know, there's there's plenty of broad strokes. Um, but I realized while reading, um, and I think that was actually also some some of the early stuff you you all sent over that sort of like immediately I was like, I think I might know very little actually about the Roman Empire, less than <laughs> I really even realize that has been informed by pop culture and just media and how it kind of is like of a, a base through line through so much of what we consume that it like I, I have knowledge from those things that is very far from the actual history but it is interesting to know see how it just weaves into sort of like every again everyday life we wouldn't really always know but you know a lot of that is kind of baked in just because we're always sort we're always low-key talking about it. Yeah, Kirk Douglas has a lot to answer for. I will uh, completely agree with you on that one. Um, But you know what? It's funny, Dr. G and I have actually been doing a bit of research uh, for Gladiator 2. Uh, We're keeping our eyes peeled on all the media that's coming out about that because we are obviously going to be doing some special episodes on that. And you know what? I don't blame people for having completely the wrong idea about the Roman Empire because from what we're reading, Ridley Scott has once again been, you know, playing around with the history. He's got Caracalla and Geta being twins when... They were close in age, but they were actually just brothers and their whole appearance, I'd say, is a little bit off. And I I have a feeling that the way that they're going to be interacting with each other is also going to be not exactly true to the history, which was incredibly murderous. So most people probably have completely the wrong idea about the Roman Empire because they interact with it through TV shows and movies, which aren't obliged, obviously, to you know have more evidence-based accounts of things. I think there's this way in which the TV series and movies in particular have a bit of a license to play around with some of the things that we do know, but also really thinking about the gaps that we have in the evidence as well. So there is a sense in which it's always a bit of a creative process. And I would say with our book, it's definitely history, but there's also that creative process as well. Like we bring our sense of humor to it. We bring our own sense of politics as well. There's no way in which a historian is ever objective and neutral. It's impossible, I think, for human beings to be that way. Um, So 
definitely we bring our own take as well, but I'd say we, we try to stuff it with as many bits of ancient evidence as we possibly can to <laughs> make sure that we give a, a bigger picture than what you might get with a television show or a movie, even if it is epic. And I'm really looking forward to Gladiator 2 for that reason. Um, so to wrap us up, I'm wondering, Casey, what is your Roman Empire? My Roman Empire, I mean, to give you a rather boring answer, I suppose it's kind of obvious, but my Roman Empire is, is books. You know, I live and breathe them every single day. Um, do I, and not to say that I think about work all the time, because in working with you all and working with a lot of the authors at Ulysses Press, I work um, primarily in nonfiction, but in my personal life, I love, love a fiction, fiction novel. So I guess, and I get on both sides of the coin, I get to uh, be thinking and loving books all the time. So that's my Roman empire. Um, I am constantly, constantly thinking about them every day, certainly. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to disagree with a, a love of books. Um, <laughs> she might be there with you. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the collection. <laughs> Actually, I did have a cheeky surprise question for you, which is peeling back the curtain a little bit, but for, li uh, for listeners of the podcast, you'll know that the way that we wrote our last book was that Dr. G and I each sort of took turns doing different chapters, and we've never really entirely revealed which ones we wrote in our first book. I was wondering, Casey, when you were reading the manuscript, could you tell the differences between us and the sections that we wrote in this book? Oh, my gosh. No, I don't think I could. Now I'm like, uh, was there an obvious hint that I'm? No, no, I was just, missing? I was just wondering because we obviously we wrote we wrote different parts separately. We divided up the pieces. We did each obviously read each other's stuff and make you know suggestions and edits. That's kind of how we how we work generally. But we were kind of wondering when we sent it to you, it was all obviously in one lot. It wasn't clearly identified who wrote what. And so I guess I was just suddenly kind of curious, could you actually tell that there was a slight shift in, you know, the way that a chapter was written or anything like that? I mean, the word count in mine was probably a bit of a giveaway, but <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you've set yourself up, Dr. Oh, yeah, well, I, now I, have to... I, I gave away the answer at the beginning. Duh. <laughs> well, now I have to think back about like what, where, where were those? Where, where did we make those cuts? Because that would, but I can't, I can't think back on like you know, I can't see a clear line between the two of you, um, because I, I don't know, maybe I just had such great time reading through the book that I didn't, as doesn't explicitly pay attention to like any changes in language. I think that both of you have such a natural flow when talking about. Roman history to make it so accessible and easy to read that you're just sort of like I don't reading so fast trying to like get to the next word and learning learning something new I mean I loved where we like ended with the with the footnotes I'm always really excited like you when you get to one you get to be like oh and then there's a little treat for me um <laughs> a little extra pocket of information so um you know I guess having too much fun reading it um <laughs> So that's it's going to be my guess. Jean, I've been working together for too long. That's that's the. Uh... <laughs> I say we've started to meld together into one great hive mind. <laughs> uh, oh my god! Well. I mean, I'm curious to know just from the two of you, based on your experience now writing two books, what have you found is, you know, what was different the second time, uh, or was there anything to just kind of flow? Was there was there anything that was really different? book two? I think the sense of um, a strong guidance and direction this time. We, we had a lot of um, freedom with the first one because it was not only an independent publisher, but a very new publisher. So everybody was kind of learning as they went in that sense, whereas this was much more structured and guided, I would say. And I think for us, that has been really nice. Um, I think I think we still consider ourselves probably new writers in many respects and even though we've written many things individually over a long period of time for different outlets and things like that I think writing a book is a, a very different sort of proposition it's a much more focused uh time-based kind of thing like you you do have a real deadline and it is a big piece of your time and your effort so 
there's not a moment when you're in the process of writing a book that you're not really kind of thinking about it in the back of your mind being like, oh yeah, got to get to this thing and got to find some time here and do some typing and do some thinking. And that whole process has been really nourished, I think, by working with you guys. And there's been really gentle guidance and constructive feedback. And I found the whole process a real pleasure actually. Yeah, definitely. And I I actually kind of think that it's a bit like, not me personally, but it's about how I think some women I have known have felt about their wedding in that there's just so much planning and stuff that goes into it. And as Dr. G said, you are always kind of thinking about it, even when you're not actually actively working on it. And then when it kind of arrives and it's published and it's over you, you're kind of like, oh, this is gaping hole in my life because I've just been thinking about this for so long and now it's here. And I'm like, it's, it's over. That's, that's it. It's just, it's just printed. And that's, that's all. <laughs> it enters into this whole new phase where it's in the world. It's, in it's, the like world. it's out there now. Yeah. Yeah. But look, I mean, Dr. G and I have talked about this before. Um, something that we learned, it's, it's been so nice, even though it's hard because we obviously have, you know, families, full-time jobs and the podcast, which is kind of another job on top of that. It, it can be hard obviously to do these extra projects, but it is just such a treat getting to work with Dr. G in this capacity. Um, you know, she's always so supportive because I'm always the one that totally freaks out uh, at numerous points along the way. And yeah, it's just, it's just so nice to be able to collaborate like in this particular medium and have something of our work sort of in print and out there in the world together. And so I always get a kick out of seeing my name next to hers because she's, she's such an amazing academic. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a real, it, I just kind of, kind of believe that this is what we've got to do together. Oh, Dr. Rad, you're going to make me cry. I like everything that we've done <laughs> that we've built together. And it's like, we're such a unifying force. And I think we, we really balance each other with the different skill sets that we bring. And like, as an example, uh, I went to a medieval fair recently and I saw some Roman reenactors doing their thing. And I was like, that's anachronistic and my husband was like are you gonna go over and have a chat and I was like oh no that's I couldn't possibly (laughs) and uh, I was just I just awkwardly went somewhere else and then later on Fiona messaged me a couple hours later and she's like I found these Roman reenactors when I was out and about and I was like you at the same medieval fair that I (laughs) and it's nowhere near where I live it's pretty far from her place as well and we were both there. And I think the striking, one of the striking differences about Dr. Rad and myself and our approaches is that she just dives in. And that is the thing that really creates so many opportunities for what we do together. And there's so much of the success of the podcast and this book that is based on her being like, you know what, what's, what could happen? You know, let's, <laughs> let's, let's just try this thing. And I love that. And I, you know, together, I think we're an amazing duo. So it's like, and she's much smarter than she gives herself credit for. Not really, but I can come up That's with a good record. Title. <laughs> my true gift in life. Like I was showing my colleagues, uh, my copy of the book arrived the other day and I was showing my colleagues at work and they, of course, were just flipping through because, you know, they're going to sit there and read the whole book immediately. And they were looking at the, you know, the contents and they were like, oh, these are really good titles. I'm like, it's my one true gift in life, coming up with band names and book titles. <laughs> <laughs> amazing well you two should be very very proud it's a really great book it's beautiful and i i'm really excited to see uh, how people react to it you know and and i'm very excited to hear more uh, about what i do and don't know thanks to gladiator 2 after i go see it so <laughs> There'll be plenty of content coming from us. We are we are waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Board your buses, people. It's coming. Well, thank you so much, Casey, for taking the time to sit down with us. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all of your support and all the support from everyone at Ulysses Press to bring this book to life. We're really excited. You are very patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. And congrats again. It's so, so exciting. Thank you. Woohoo!